The Pacific Theater was witness to some of the most desperate fighting of the Second World War. Intense battles raged against tenacious Japanese forces whose warrior code demanded death before dishonor. The slow and painful Allied advance towards Japan was marked by a crescendo of furious combat. But far removed from the key battles, a much different war was being waged. One that demanded a different kind of attack plan. One that emphasized stealth and surprise. A plan that would ultimately strangle Japanese shipping. Operating alone on the surface and beneath the waves, often in the dark of night, this relatively small force became known as the Silent Service. Fleet action was an entirely different thing. Big ships shooting guns at great range. Uh, the submarine would mix it with the enemy, get in close. We would try to fire from a thousand yards range. The idea was that you're in there, you're hitting them very quickly by surprise, and you're getting out of there quickly so that they can't pursue you. America's deployment of the submarine in World War II led to a rare occurrence in naval warfare, one in which technical innovation helped define a strategy. The creation of that strategy was impeded by an outdated pre-war doctrine and a command structure unwilling to release the submarine from its cautious constraints. Consequently, it took many months of trial and error for the attack plan to emerge. But when it did, its lethal effectiveness against Japanese tankers and freighters was as unexpected as it was instrumental to the defeat of the forces of the rising sun. The strategy developed between World War I and World War II called for submarines to support the surface fleet scouting ahead and clearing the way for battleships. The priority targets for submarines were strictly military. Commercial shipping was considered off limits. Historically, the attack on an unarmed merchant vessel by an armed warship was known as commerce raiding. This most ancient of naval strategies, a form of guerrilla warfare at sea, had fallen into disrepute by the Second World War. Ironically, the origins of U.S. naval strategy were founded on commerce raiding. This tactic was used by the colonies during the American Revolution and later by the Confederacy during the Civil War. Fast frigates and privateers became the weapons of choice for the weaker naval power. These swift vessels could seize cargo from unarmed merchantmen and still outrun warships sent in hot pursuit. One commerce raider, the Alabama, was known as the Shark of the Confederacy during the Civil War. In one famous 22-month sortie, her captain, Raphael Semmes, ravaged the Union seaborne trade. Raphael Sims was the skipper of the Alabama. Uh, she was a Confederate vessel, of course. The Alabama took uh, 60 Union uh, merchant vessels. He uh, nonetheless killed not a single person and thereby set a very, very humane precedent. And that's why I think he's the greatest uh, commerce raider uh, in American history. Certainly 60 vessels taken as a record. The Alabama was taken by American naval officers after the Civil War as the model for future warfare. That model dictated naval tactics until the late 19th century, when the Industrial Revolution transformed the United States. A book by an American naval strategist, Alfred Thayer Mahan, captured the imagination of the times. He came up with his conception of uh, sea power, that is to say, capital fleet engagements uh, for command of the sea to break the enemy's will, and if that doesn't work, then you'll invade the enemy if you have to. And he very consciously tried to uh, disassociate himself and the U.S. Navy from the uh, legacy of Raphael Sims.
This book uh, was the right book at the right time, and so he became the man for his time, and his ideas were adopted uh, by the Navy, by the nation, uh, by the industrialists who saw a great profit to be made, of course, in building uh, these big ships, and uh, spurred forward by Teddy Roosevelt when he became president. Fast frigates were now eclipsed by heavily armored cruisers and battleships. At the same time, improvements in diesel engine technology and torpedoes had turned the once experimental submarine into a true warship. On both sides of the Atlantic, it was largely believed that submarines, like destroyers, would play a supporting role to the fleet. The war of the submarine prior to World War I was very ambiguous, and apparently the Germans, the Kaiser, had studied uh, Raphael Sims and the Alabama to some extent. There apparently was some tendency within the Germans to think in terms of using the submarine as a commerce raider. But by and large, the thought was that the uh, submarine would be the, uh, a scout for the fleet, and it might protect the coast, which is a historic role for uh, smaller vessels against invading fleets. It was the Germans who truly grasped the versatility of the submarine as an ocean-going weapon, one that could attack both military and commercial targets. During World War I, Germany's undersea boats, or U-boats, hobbled Britain's powerful fleet. By late 1916, unrestricted submarine warfare, in effect, commerce raiding, had practically starved the British out of the war. She was saved from the U-boat menace by implementing the convoy system, which provided relative safety in numbers. But when the war ended, Germany's U-boat successes were quickly forgotten. England and the United States reverted to their pre-war fascination with large surface warships dreadnoughts. Indeed, the submarine had even become an object of loathing for some. Its strategic importance was downplayed or purposely ignored. During the early stages of the next war, this neglect would severely hamper the efforts and the attack plan of the silent service. Since the turn of the century, the rise of Imperial Japan had been the cause of increased concern in the West. Following the First World War, America dusted off and revised a long-standing blueprint for a naval war with Japan, Plan Orange. Created at the height of the Dreadnought era, Plan Orange had little consideration for submarines. Inspired by Alfred Thayer Mahan's naval philosophy, it envisioned a climactic battle between surface fleets for command of the Pacific. The Americans would be forced to fall back from the Philippines and then regroup in Hawaii and fight their way west, uh, seeking out a major fleet engagement between themselves and the Japanese. The Japanese uh, pretty much bought into this Mahanian prescription themselves and up through World War II, they were looking for this ultimate Mahanian battle. The destruction of the enemy's economy was central to Plan Orange. But using submarines as a weapon was a sensitive issue. The German U-boat campaign was viewed as brutal and uncivilized. The British even lobbied unsuccessfully for the submarine to be outlawed. The United States was a signatory to the London Naval Conference of 1930 that prohibited unrestricted sinkings. As Plan Orange evolved, the role of the submarine was marginalized. So what do you do with the submarine then? 1920 to 1939, 40. The answer is that you treat it again as a scout of the fleet, an auxiliary of the fleet, but the idea of using it as a commerce raider was specifically outlawed. Even as the submarine reverted to its pre-World War I mission of scouting and support, the vessel itself was undergoing a remarkable transformation. The strategic and tactical requirements of Plan Orange produced what would become the long-range 
highly capable and technologically advanced fleet submarine of the Second World War. They would form a scouting line in front of the fleet, sweeping the sea of Japanese destroyers and clearing the way for the battleships to engage the main enemy force. Fire control, and the process of tracking targets and aiming torpedoes, was critically important to the success of the emerging attack plan. During the 1930s, torpedo fire control consisted of looking through the periscope and estimating the target's bearing and range. The process was slow and imprecise. If there were errors, which were frequent, Angle changes had to be recalculated manually. It was more of an art than a science. Plan Orange demanded a better approach. What was needed was the submarine equivalent of a battleship fire control system, something that could continuously track the target and provide angle solutions for the torpedoes. Here on San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf, the fleet submarine USS Pampanito houses one of the most remarkable secrets of the silent service, the Torpedo Data Computer, or TDC. Pampanito's is the only functioning World War II era TDC in the world. It was restored by computer engineer and TDC historian Terry Lindell. The key idea behind the Torpedo Data Computer was to allow this U.S. submarine to stand further away from the target and still destroy the enemy. Well, the further away you can hit a target before they know you're there, the more chance you have of surviving the attack. The TDC, a complex bundle of electromechanical gears and cams, was key to developing an effective attack plan. It provided the American submarine captain with unrivaled situational awareness a running overview of the course and positions of both the target and his own submarine. Angle settings for the torpedoes were continuously generated and updated. The goal of the torpedo data computer was to both track the target and the submarine simultaneously and solve the equations of motion in real time. Whenever the captain wanted to fire, the torpedo had to be ready to go. One, two, and three. The first TDC, the Mark I, was produced in great secrecy by the Armour Corporation of Brooklyn, New York, in 1936. This is the only known picture of the Mark I TDC. At 25, Don Gittens, a recent graduate, got his first job at Armour working on TDCs. When the computer was installed in a number of submarines, I supervised the installation of each one. And then I had to go down to Panama, where they had a, a submarine school, and instruct the various submarine skippers in how to use the torpedo data computer. And then when they were ready to go out to sea, I'd go to sea with them, and we'd actually operate the computer I'd stay in there and operate it while they stood at my side and watched how I did it. The TDC Mark I was so large and complex that it could only be installed in pieces through a hole cut in the side of the hull and then assembled in the submarine's control room. It was very successful. Oh yeah, it worked very well. The big problem with it was that the skippers didn't like the fact that they were up in the conning tower and the Mark I was down in the control room. They couldn't, they were, they were, they couldn't see what was going on. And they had to keep yelling down, have you got a solution yet, you know, and that sort of thing. Gittens was given the job of designing a smaller version of the TDC, the Mark III, to fit inside the submarine's conning tower. It is a relatively small computer by the day's standards. Internally, it's very, very compact. It's built with a tremendous amount of consideration with regard to its survivability, its toughness, the fact that uh, it could be depth charged and shaken and disturbed and still keep right on running. 
true to course, producing perfect answers, no matter how many times it went through those kinds of tremendous physical trauma. And the captains reported over and over again that when many other systems in the submarine would break down, the torpedo data computer kept right on running. The TDC Mark III gave a tremendous edge to the American submarine fleet. Let's go. It remained highly classified until well after World War II. Thanks to Plan Orange, the Bureau of Ordnance and Don Gittens, it had been developed and was being installed in fleet submarines before the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. Probably the most important single instrument in the submarine was the TDC. We had other instruments for other purposes. But this was the thing that enabled us to carry out our mission, namely aim the torpedoes and shoot them. But for all the submarine's technical capability, its attack doctrine stressed caution instead of aggressiveness. This was due primarily to the US Navy's lack of recent combat experience. The sense of vulnerability was so strong that pre-war training stressed remaining submerged during daylight hours, surfacing only at night to recharge batteries. Running on the surface during the day was deemed as irresponsible. In the Asiatic submarine squadron, based in the Philippines, captains were threatened with instant loss of command if their periscopes were even sighted during an exercise. Neither night surface nor group tactics were practiced, and prohibition against unrestricted warfare meant submarine crews had received no training in attacking either convoys or solitary merchant ships. The caution that gripped the US submarine service in the 1930s was made even worse by the flawed development of its primary weapon, the Mark 14 torpedo. It had never been tested under real or simulated battle conditions. Incredibly, the World War II attack plan would be initiated with an entire generation of submarine crews who had never seen or heard the detonation of a torpedo. December the 7th, 1941. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor began at 7.55 on a quiet Sunday morning. Six hours later, a message was flashed to the Pacific Fleet from Admiral Harold Stark, Chief of Naval Operations. Execute unrestricted air and submarine warfare against Japan. As a young naval officer, Stark had been stationed in London during World War I. Harold R. Stark issued the order to the Pacific Fleet, commence unrestricted submarine warfare. And that's using the same phrase which had been used to damn the Germans in World War I. It's a very, very clear statement that we are now going to do what we said we wouldn't do that was outlawed uh, throughout the interwar period. And we're going to do it against the Japanese because I know, I, Harold Stark, know how effective it was against the English in uh, World War I because I was there. But it was an order more easily given than followed. The submarine force was suddenly deprived of its cautious pre-war mandate. Submarines were to attack anything Japanese afloat, including commercial shipping. But a comprehensive attack plan still did not exist. At least the submarines themselves, which the crews affectionately called boats, were up to the task. The diesel electric fleet submarine was strong, fast and lethal. The many new electrical systems, including the torpedo data computer, motivated an attempt at climate control, which increased what the Navy called habitability. They were wonderful boats. I know they were small, but they were excellent. Air conditioning was put in submarines to take care of the grounds from electrical systems. The people profited from it, of course. All the instrumentation on board is better off in a controlled environment because the original boats that I went out on had no air conditioning and boy, it was just wet inside all the time. You couldn't wait to get up on the surface and get some fresh air. <laughs> With brilliant pre-war foresight, 
Submarine captains had insisted on moving all sensor systems into the conning tower with the periscope to better manage the task of tracking and sinking enemy ships. In the submarine service of the U.S. Navy, the captains were given tremendous latitude with regard to how their ship was organized. And one of the most personalized parts of the entire process was how the attack operated in the conning tower. Um, it's a key idea. It's the key reason why the ship is out there. And each captain's technique was a little different. The commanding officer of the submarine always formed his own team just the way he wanted it. Some skippers stayed in the conning tower and had their executive officers run the periscope. Uh, other skippers uh, didn't do it, so everyone made his own decisions in this connection. Moving the sonar, or sound detection equipment, into the conning tower with the TDC required lengthening the small spherical compartment by one foot to 15 foot 8 inches. It became a cramped and busy place. But the conning tower represented a level of technological integration that was truly amazing. The fleet boats were the stealth bombers of their day. The attack functions were effectively isolated in the conning tower, which became home to what was called the fire control party. Our problem was to get the information to the TDC and keep it accurate, and this required good observation through the periscope or from the bridge, depending on whether it was a submerged or surface attack. Contrary to popular perception, firing torpedoes was more than just looking through the periscope and aiming. Bearing mark. Target bearing 106 degrees. 106 degrees. Sound. Sound bearing 106. Angle on the bow, six degrees port. Range mark, target range, one five double O. One five double O. The immediate problem in the attack plan was to estimate the target's course and speed. The target's bearing was read from a graduated ring around the periscope. Bearing mark, target bearing, one zero six degrees. One zero six degrees. The captain, or executive officer, also gave the angle on the bow, an estimate of the angle between the target's heading and the observer's line of sight. Angle on the bow, six degrees port. Range was estimated by reading the angle between the water line and the target's masthead, or bridge, usually by a split image rangefinder built into the periscope. Range mark, target range, one five double O. One five double oh. The target's speed was deduced from counting propeller revolutions. A plot was started incorporating all the available data on the targets and the submarine's own movements. As the attack developed, the TDC provided increasingly accurate directional instructions to the torpedoes. The torpedo data computer will itself calculate the target's course and target speed. So if your estimates are wrong, it will show the error, and then you put in a different estimate. Fire two. No other submarine in the world could match the American fleet boat for its superior capabilities. Yet during the first two years of war, these advantages were all but negated by the absence of a comprehensive attack strategy and defective torpedoes. Despite the declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, most senior submariners had not lost their disdain for commerce raiding. There was a mixed feeling, what do you do with the submarine? And uh, despite uh, what I consider to be Stark's great vision, the entire Navy hadn't bought into it, nor was it structurally prepared to uh, concentrate uh, all of its submarine assets the way the Germans did in both World War I and World War II. Once again, Britain's lifeline to America was nearly severed. Off the eastern seaboard of the United States, the Germans sent 400 merchant ships to the bottom, exceeding two million tons, with the loss of no less than 5,000 seamen. In the Pacific, by comparison, 44 American fleet boats 
hamstrung by the lack of centralized control and planning, were scattered in an indiscriminate and piecemeal way. Despite individual feats of bravery and sacrifice, by the summer of 1942, the fleet boats were averaging less than half an enemy ship sunk per patrol. But the silent service would soon reverse this dismal record, and with it, the fortunes of the war. The seven-month campaign for Guadalcanal from August 1942 to February 1943 was an epic battle of attrition. Fought on land, in the air, and on the sea. It was the turning point of the Pacific War. Japan's failure to resupply its Guadalcanal forces was a somber realization that merchant shipping, or the lack of it, was the weak link in her defensive strategy. By the end of 1942, Japan's merchant fleet had suffered a net loss of 178,000 tons, the beginning of a downward spiral from which the emperor never recovered. American submarines, while targeting Japanese warships, according to their pre-war attack plan, had nonetheless sunk 180 Japanese merchant ships in 1942, totaling some 725,000 tons. Had these ships been available to the Japanese, they would not have been forced off Guadalcanal. But despite this early glimpse of success, the prejudice against attacking commercial shipping retained its grip on the silent service for many more months. Why did it take so long for the uh, submarine, the American submarine, to become the great uh, commerce raider and destroyer of Japanese uh, merchant fleet and, uh, and tankers? I don't know if there's any uh, particular single answer. And what uh, the peculiar ironies, I think, of 1943 is that's when the U.S. submarine in the Pacific begins to become very, very effective as a destroyer of the Japanese merchant fleet, including tankers. And it's that very same year that the U-boat uh, in the Atlantic is defeated by means of the convoys and the other weapons used by the Allies. Americans are starting to do the same things that the uh, Germans had done, and they're doing it very, very well against the Japanese. 1943 was a pivotal year for the submarine attack plan on many levels. The problems that had plagued the Mark 14 torpedo had been identified and largely corrected by October. Perhaps more importantly, a new generation of aggressive captains took command. Men who were not afraid to push the limits of their boats and crews. The idea of running after a target on the surface in daytime was no longer thought to be a suicidal proposition. Well, the problem with the fleet submarine in World War II was that submerged, it travels at about walking speed. So the only way you can do a submerged attack is to get in front of the target and wait for it to come to you. You have to remember these submarines were speedboats. They would go 20 to 22 knots on the surface, much faster than anything else they were trying to catch. And so it would go at a distance where the target could not sight the submarine because it was so low in the water, but the submarine could track the target because of the smoke and the height of the target. They would end around the target, which means they would speed at a distance to get out in front of the target and then curve in in front of it and then submerge and wait for the target to come to them. Radar, which had been in its infancy at the start of the war, matured and became widely available during 1943. With electronic beams scanning the darkness for miles ahead, captains took to running on the surface at night. It became the favored means of attack. Most submarines will tell you that radar was by far the most important thing that was developed for submarine use during the war. It enabled us to find the targets, track them, place them in context with each other, decide how we were going to attack, what direction we were going to attack from, and so forth. We, of course, added in such factors as moon, the direction of the moon and the direction of the wind and all the other things, but the radar was what told us where the enemy was. 
The new radar, Type SJ, was a search radar for use on the surface. It was capable of picking up targets at a distance of 10,000 yards, over five miles. The targets could be electronically detected before being visually sighted. The submarine would then use its surface speed to move into attack position without fear of being spotted by the enemy. Neither Japanese submarines nor escorts had radar of any kind. This electronic wonder put US boats in a class of their own for fighting at night or in poor visibility. Night attacks had a special intensity. A high-speed run in darkness culminating in an explosion when the torpedoes struck the target. There was a huge ball of fire hit it and it stopped dead in the water. You could see men jumping over the side. We passed so close that our bridge, the paint on there blistered. That's how close we were. The full drama of a night surface attack was difficult to document. That scene is best conjured by historical artists like Tom Freeman after painstaking research. This is the USS Harder during one of her night attacks in 44. Right now, what I'm just trying to do is highlight a, an area that you don't, wouldn't normally see in this, at nighttime like this. Yeah, if you have an explosion at night, especially a large one, especially on a ship, you have fuel oil, you have ammunition, you have all the paint that would be on that ship. What I try to do is to show that movement, that feeling, the heat. I want the individual to see the heat, feel the heat, and just say, this is something that I did not want to deal with, or I have been there, I've seen it. But a painting, no matter how lifelike, barely hints at the experience of such an attack. Only those who were there can know the true intensity of the moment. During an attack, uh, I always had a very strong emotional response. I felt as if I were actually firing the torpedo personally, shooting it out the tube, shoving it out with my right arm. In fact, uh, uh, there was a sort of euphoric feeling about it. I've got here, I've done it, and I'm beating them at their own game. I'm here, and I'm doing my job, and they can't stop me, and I'm gonna sink that ship, so help me. I used to feel that I was a, a, a remorseless function of the ship. I had no emotions of my own, but the fact was, that I'm looking back on it now, I was very emotional. In 1944, the silent service hit its stride in the Pacific. Over 600 Japanese commercial ships were sent to the bottom, more than the combined total for the two previous years. More importantly, tankers were singled out as priority targets, blocking Japan's supply of oil from the East Indies. The attack plan had finally combined the operational capabilities of the submarine with the strategic requirements of the war. The stage was set for final victory. In four years of war, the fleet submarine's ability to attack at night and in any weather was continuously improved. The boats displayed many subtle exterior changes, a succession of mast and antenna arrangements protruding from the conning tower told of an ever-changing electronic environment. Yet the most secret tool of the attack plan, more secret even than the torpedo data computer, remained relatively unchanged during the course of the war. Questions regarding its operation were not tolerated. Advances and improvements to its capabilities were unannounced. Even its name, like the Hebrew God, was unspeakable. Alluded to only by a symbolic reference, it was special intelligence, otherwise known as ultra, the deciphering and exploitation of Japanese coded communications. This was a weapon of such staggering importance to the attack plan that few even knew of its existence, and those who did were sworn to protect its secrecy. 
For the most part, they didn't know that it was it came from the breaking of the enemy's codes. That was a very special secret. Some of the captains knew. Some of them kind of figured it out on their own. Some of them, for special reasons, knew. But most of the crews didn't. They just knew there was this special uh, form of, of uh, really reliable intelligence. At least one member of the silent service, Captain John Cromwell, went down with the stricken submarine Sculpin rather than be captured and risk betraying Ultra under Japanese torture. The US Navy used special intelligence from the beginning of the war. This was an invaluable asset to the submariners. On January the 27th, 1942, returning from the first war patrol in Japanese home waters, the USS Gudgeon sank a Japanese submarine underway on the surface. The first ever sinking of an enemy boat by an American submarine was the result of an ultra message. By November 1943, the code used by the Japanese merchant marine, the so-called Maru Code, had also been broken. This was significant to the attack plan because the Japanese had belatedly formed multi-ship convoys. The silent service, employing Ultra in conjunction with group formations called wolf packs, swept the seas of Japanese merchant ships. The further into the war we get, the more brazen, the more aggressive, the more on the surface the approaches are. And so this idea of continually hounding a convoy until every last ship is sunk became part of what the captains did. The idea of introducing wolf packs into the attack process where there was more than one submarine involved, that was something that developed as the war went on. As important as Ultra was to the attack plan, maintaining its secrecy was equally critical. In the radio room of San Francisco's USSS Pampanito is an electro-mechanical cipher machine, or decoder, carried on board every US submarine during World War II. This is the only such decoder outside the federal government. This one was found in a basement storeroom of the super-secret National Security Agency after extensive research by technology historian Richard Pekelny. It was only declassified in 1995 and loaned to the Pampanito. This machine is called the ECM Mark II. It was used in World War II to protect our communications so that we could send messages to our submarines and other ships at sea and to our armies in, on the land as well without our enemies, the Japanese and the Germans, the Axis powers, being able to understand the messages. When a signal sent out on a radio, anybody can receive the signal. By encrypting it, running it through this machine using a special key, a password, if you will, uh, they were able to make it so that only the people that had the machine and the key and knew how to use it would be able to read those messages. The ECM Mark II, employed throughout the Second World War, was used for all coded message traffic, including Ultra. It was the most secret piece of equipment on the boat, subject to a shallow water operating procedure called the Hundred Fathom Rule. Submarine historian John Alden was the communications officer on the USS Lamprey. When we had to cross the 600-foot line, the 100-fathom curve, we were told to jettison our uh, electric coating machine because uh, the waters there were considered to be possibly salvageable, and they didn't want the Japanese to, to have any chance of getting a hold of our coating machine. So we actually had to uh, break up the coating machine and throw it overboard and burn all of our registered publications that went with it, the coding tables and things. In July 1945, a machine like this one decoded an urgent message regarding an Allied submarine in distress. It led to a remarkable mission that strayed far from the typical attack, 
but one that vividly demonstrated the bond shared by Allied submariners. At that time, the USS Cod was on patrol off the coast of Southeast Asia. She was ordered to assist a Dutch submarine stranded in the South China Sea. On board the Cod was a young motor machinist mate, Norm Jensen, who had been assigned to help document on film the secret exploits of the silent service. I went to the captain and says, Captain, what's she doing? Is he making any signal signs? He says, yes, he is. I said, I'd like to get some shots of it. He says, get your hindquarters up above there and do it. When we first approached it, all we saw was a blinking light. We came up to it, and here was this vessel. All I could see was that thing at an angle, probably about a 35 degree angle. It had hit the reef and gone boom, right up, and then sunk down. It hit it at low tide, surprisingly enough and at high tide, it couldn't get off. Jensen captured the Cod's attempts to tow the 019 off the reef. They failed, and finally the Dutch crew abandoned ship and were brought aboard the American submarine. That was the saddest thing you ever saw in your life, with those guys coming aboard. They'd been aboard that thing for five years, hadn't even been home for over five years. One of the fellows had a little doll kind of like a Kachina doll that they have in the Hopis. That doll had been with him, it had been their good luck one. To keep the Dutch boat out of enemy hands, it had to be scuttled. Demolition charges racked its frame. What had begun as a rescue mission took a surreal turn as the Cod attacked the Dutch submarine with her deck cannon and torpedoes finished her off. The 019 clings to Lad Reef to this very day, a cautionary beacon to all passing vessels. The USS Cod survived the war and can be found in Cleveland, Ohio. On her bridge, there is a distinctive emblem, a remembrance of a celebration given in her honor by a very appreciative Dutch crew. The Cod and the Pampanito are among the few remaining examples of a weapon that rewrote naval history. Developed in the shadow of the battleship, the fleet submarines of the silent service brought Japan to her knees through an innovative and fluid attack plan. That evolved from the commerce raiding legacy of Confederate Captain Raphael Semmes who decimated Union merchant shipping during the Civil War. Today, the boats of the silent service are nuclear powered, incredibly fast and lethal. But perhaps the spirit of the attack has not changed since it was born in the Pacific more than half a century ago.